Zoe, it's so great to have you here for Future Fridays. Uh, you recently were on the near uh, top 10 list of women at three, which is so exciting, and are building an incredible company now called Glass after a really exciting career in um, ZX and um, also, you know, the, the CPG uh, area. So I am so excited to dive in and, and learn more about you. But first, can you kick us off with um, where are you based these days and what are you working on? Great. Well, thanks, Alana. So glad to be here. Um, I'm based in New York and I'm the CEO and founder of Glass, which is the first Web3 platform purpose built for the $1.5 trillion global alcohol industry uh, and its unique community, social and regulatory needs. Um, so what does this mean? Glass uh, really for the first time enables alcohol brands to connect directly with their consumers during uh, the point of purchase, as well as during the broader social occasions where alcohol, uh, where, where beverages are, are so relevant, um, and to earn tokens from their favorite brands by purchasing product, but also uh, engaging in social activities, uh, brand advocacy, things like uh, maybe inviting their friends together out to the local bar, uh, hosting an NBA watch party, um, and uh, taking fun cocktail photos, trying new recipes. Uh, and then consumers can redeem those tokens they earn from brands to unlock exclusive social rewards offered by the beverage brands that can really leverage the assets and resources that these brands have already in the form of their connections to sports, music, uh, through sponsorships and relationships, uh, to bars, nightlife, uh, et cetera. Um, so imagine you're, you know, sharing a cocktail with your friends, taking a picture on Instagram as you know, we all so often do, <laughs> but now you're actually earning uh, tokens from that brand that you could then use to maybe get behind the scenes at uh, Coachella later later that year. I love this so much. Um, and I can't wait to dive into the first question of like how you got into the Web3 space and even this concept of tokenized um, loyalty and rewards and marketing within the alcohol space for People who are listening may not be aware like the um, the alcohol and beverage space is like highly regulate, regulated and crypto obviously is as much possible decentralized and anonymous. So how would you in a marketing context know if somebody was of age to be communicated to about um, alcohol? And like there's so many different layers to that. And um, I do want to highlight just your background, maybe just like a quick brief bio of how you got here because you've done so much in the retail and specialty retail space, everything from being a um, equity researcher at TD, um, you were at CB Insights leading um, CPG in retail, and then ZX, uh, ZX Ventures um, and now Glass. So like that's such a, from like traditional, almost like financial analysis all the way into this now execution. I'd love to hear like, how did that happen? How did you go from A to B? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really been a, a career progression from kind of observing and analyzing toward executing. Um, so my first job out of college was, um, you know, I went to Stanford University. I studied international relations. Um, I lived, I then, after college, my first job was uh in Shanghai, actually, um, being a kind of Silicon Valley representative at, at the Bank of China, um, which was a very unique experience, um, taught me a lot about uh, researching markets, uh, consumer habits, things like that. Uh, I then moved on to the finance side, uh, equity research, as you said, um, soon after, well, a few years after, but when the retail sector was still dealing with the fallout of the 2008 recession. Um, so really interesting time seeing how these traditional legacy companies like Macy's, Nordstrom, were starting to adapt to new technologies and focus on becoming more experiential. That's when the, the kind of experiential retail uh, buzzword or kind of mode really took off. Um, so I then took that 
that interest in, you know, how these very legacy industries are adapting to new technologies and new consumer habits into my time at CB Insights, uh, an analytics startup where I was uh, analyzing how then legacy food and beverage companies were starting to adapt, to invest in startups, to adapt to technologies, uh, and then certainly to, to my role just before launching Glass, uh, ZX Ventures, which is the VC fund of AB InBev, uh, the world's largest beer company with brands like Budweiser, Stella Artois, et cetera. Um, I just, I found that so exciting to think about how these brands that, you know, are, are so present or so relatable, so many of us take for granted, um, can really leverage technology to boost those user experiences and create those social and uh, touch points that kind of reach people in, in new ways. Um, and that's how I started to, so um, at CX Ventures, I uh, ultimately developed and then led a new investment vertical that we call that I called the future of socializing, looking into how, um, you know, of course, alcohol is so fundamentally tied to social occasions and so inherently dependent on people getting together in person to socialize. And yet, the brands, I, there's so much room for opportunity for the industry to really better directly support those social occasions. Um, so really my my aha moment was, you know, even seeing something like a, a Super Bowl ad, which um, Budweiser, so many alcohol brands are see as such a key moment that costs uh, $7 million for a 30 second advertisement that's top down, that's no digital connection, that's kind of riding off this social occasion, but without really participating in it. And for that same amount of money, the brands could, you know, directly send drinks to over 350,000 Super Bowl watch parties. Um, so really how to support how these brands can take a step back from that top down advertising mindset and kind of more from the ground up support people who are truly building these social occasions on which the industry is so dependent. So I became very interested in this thesis overall. And then as I started to learn more about Web3, I saw, you know, as you said, in, in a way that I think is, is maybe counterintuitive to, to some folks, but there actually is I saw so much inherent overlap between the alcohol industry and Web3 um, along a few lines. One of those is uh, exactly, as you said, kind of ide identity management. Um, so alcohol, from this lens of social occasions, um, the, the space is very fragmented. I might be buying a drink at my local liquor store. I might be getting a cocktail at a restaurant. I might be getting a drink at... Uh, at an NBA game or at my friend's house or at a music festival. Um, and right now, those are completely unconnected touch points. Um, but with that unified consumer identity that we can support through NFTs, through Web3, um, and with that ability that, that Web3 powers for consumers to take their their point, their tokens, their earnings with them to associate those with the consumer rather than with the, the retailer. Um, that just opens up so much potential for that consistent consumer identity across touch points in a way that's particularly relevant to the alcohol space. Um, there's oh. also, the, yeah. Yeah, that's right. There's also the... Uh, the idea of regulatory compliance. Um, so we are building atop a really unique compliance protocol that my CTO has developed, that, that we've developed, um, that gates at the token, at the user wallet level, which uh, experiences, rewards, earning opportunities, users can access based on their geography, based on local alcohol regulation. Oh, wow, that's huge. I was going to ask what the sort of unique technology is. And that's um, sort of the question I'd love to build on what you just shared, because it's such an interesting journey. And the the whole co concept here um, in these conversations is talking to these visionary future thinkers like yourself. Like, what do you feel, where do you feel like the future is going in the next like five plus years that maybe you have seen across the 
uh, horizon maybe a little earlier than others? What do you imagine and anticipate? Where do you, where's this going? And um, for anyone who's in the industry now and thinking more traditionally, how can they start sparking some ideas of where the world could be going? Yeah, love that question. Um, I think how I see it is technology shifts always have outsized societal impact beyond the technology itself. So I think about uh, you know previous generation or you know previous decade platforms like uh, Uber, for example, that you know while they they were using these specific technologies like geolocation, um, you know mobile mobile technologies, it really changed consumer expectations for speed and convenience across the board in a way that impacted companies that were not even you know mobile based or in the transportation space. Um, so I see that with Web3 as well, that the technology, you know, of course, itself has so much potential. But beyond that, it's really feeding into this societal shift in our own consumer expectations for greater consumer control over our own data, greater transparency, bringing that nexus of power back to the individual and a little bit away from, uh, you know, the larger uh, platforms that have dominated our, our online presences for, for the past uh, one or two decades. And are there any people or companies that are really inspiring you in the space right now who are doing forward thinking, like quite innovative things or starting to experiment, especially with Web3 and alcohol? Like, what, I'm so curious what you're inspired by. Yeah, um, one of my big early inspirations was the Friends with Benefits DAO. Um, I looked into when I was at ZX Ventures, um, looked into this quite a bit as this incredible new way to structure social community um, to, you know, bring people together, not just digitally, but in person um, to really focus on kind of a curated community of people that shared similar interests um, and, you know, were using Tech, or, you know, aiming to use technology to help people build these more authentic social and, and community organizations and have a stake in that social community they're helping to build. Um, so that was, a, you know, really one of my early inspirations. Um, on the beverage side, um, I, I guess maybe I won't call out any of, of our Claire alcohol brands specifically, but um, I'll say Liquid Death, uh, the, the canned water brand um, is just such an incredible inspiration from a branding perspective. I think they've, um, you know, done such a good job of picking their uh, their theme and their vibe and being so consistent about it. Um, they uh, they have a loyalty program that uh, asks folks to, it, uh, they call it a, a signing your soul away contract, and they send you a PDF that you, where you're selling your soul to liquid death. And it's very funny, and it kind of feeds into that broader into that brand vibe, the strength of that brand that they've developed. And that's what I see um, with alcohol brands who have really, you know, had very little activity in the loyalty space, full stop in, in Web 2, let alone Web 3, um, that alcohol brands can use. It's not about the generic um you know, earn points here, get a 10% discount here. It's about how do the activities through which you earn points and then redeem those points all further feed into the brand ecosystem um, and all align with the, um, the, the community and the social values that the brand is trying to impart. I love that so much. When I've been communicating with some um you know, leaders in especially the alcohol space about getting into Web3 or becoming educated on Web3. One thing that's come up is just this fear of getting involved because it feels so new, right? Like it seems risky. Will if you don't understand it extremely well, will you accidentally make a, a mistake? And when your brand is your most valuable asset um, and there's a highly regulated environment, um, it can be really intimidating to start experimenting with a new technology like tokenization or tokenized loyalty. How have you addressed that as you are, you know, such an expert in this space? What advice are, would you give to somebody getting started, maybe a brand manager, whether it's in the, in the space or not, um, 
who wants to be on the leading edge, but is scared of like the risks of doing something wrong, or maybe feeling like they can't know everything. And so they just, you know, would rather just stick with their more traditional avenues. Absolutely. I'd say it's the difference between thinking about Web3 for the sake of Web3 uh, or for novelty's sake versus thinking about how Web3 can further long-term existing business objectives. So think about, you know, two, three years ago, all the kind of isolated NFT drops we saw from brands that were very much just capitalizing on the novelty factor, um, giving people, you know, for the first time, maybe a way to buy some sort of digital merchandise from the brand itself. Um, but even uh, certainly I, I saw at AB InBev, it's like, that's still kind of merchandise. It's something that lives in, that, that builds off the value of the brand, but lives as a separate business unit, a separate, um, you know, revenue stream that doesn't kind of more directly feed into the overall larger scale goals of the business. Um, so what I see and how, you know, how Glass is structured is it's all about using underlying Web3 technology, uh, our blockchain-based compliance protocol, our Web3 identity management system, to give brands a way to connect directly to consumers and to incentivize purchasing, but also brand advocacy, um, kind of brand ambassadorship in a way that can feed it directly into long-term business goals. So the KPIs that, uh, you know, are not about how much money did we make from X or Y NFT drop. The KPIs are, you know, how many new retail stores did you get into as a brand because you incentivized your consumers to be asking at their local liquor store to, to stock this new product or, you know, how many, um, how many additional uh, Instagram posts, how much broader reach did you get as a brand on Instagram because you now had this compliant, safe way to incentivize folks to be sharing pictures of the cocktails you're mixing with your product. So I think it's really about, um, as with any new technology, you know, certainly as I saw on the, the corporate venture fund side where you are continuously trying to bring new technologies into very established massive business units, it's, you know, A, how does this plug in to help you achieve your existing KPIs and objectives? And then B, how can you leverage the existing assets and resources that you already have, that the brand already has to kind of de-risk this new initiative and, and make sure it's a success. Super helpful. <clears throat> Are you seeing people and brand leaders see this as more of a way of breaking into crypto and more crypto native communities in that the user sort of needs to know or value tokens or NFTs, for example? Or are you seeing this as really just more efficient infrastructure for like identity and distribution and like hyper local activation and that like you shouldn't even tell your consumer that there's nfts or tokens happening in the background like how are you seeing the balance of the people who work with glass in particular too um and in your past lives like what are people prioritizing yeah really the latter um that really this is something that the consumer does not need to know about Web3 to understand, to get onboarded. It's more, this is giving you the brand for the first time, a way to build a direct first party digital connection to your consumers. Um, alcohol brands in the US are generally not allowed to sell directly to consumers. So they don't have that decade plus of e-commerce connections data that so many other industries have at this point. This is now giving them a legal, you know, safe, compliant way to build that connection as consumers opt in and, and start earning tokens by doing activities that help grow the brand. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's very much about, the, and there are those few alcohol brands that are really leaning into um, Web3 communities, certainly, but it's really more about, you um, you know, near term uh, for the brands that we're working with. This is this incredibly efficient, uh, legally compliant infrastructure built with the alcohol industry in mind for the first time. Um, and by the way, and, and you don't have to, you know, fully understand the everything under the hood. You, you're the consumers don't, you know, they just want to use the site and make sure it works. 
Um, but by the way, we're also future proofed. If you want to lean into NFTs in the future, if you want to right enable that you know token portability across uh, ecosystems in the future, we'll be uh, so well positioned to do that. Thank you so much for joining today and sharing all of these insights. It's been really fun to hear what you're thinking and where you think the future is going. And and really, I feel like what you're doing is such a practical application and and so accessible to anyone. So thank you for sharing all of that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, looking forward. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. And how can we stay in touch with you, Zoe, as you build glass and share about your journey, both personally and, and the company that you're building? Absolutely. Um, we'll certainly check us out at uh, www.glass.fun. Uh, easy URL to remember. Um, I'm at Zoe, Z-O-E, at glass.fun. Definitely send send me a note. We're uh, onboarding beta testers. We're in our soft launch with initial clients. We'll be launching more publicly, uh, more fully uh, later this summer. And uh, yeah, then Zoe Levitt, uh, Z-O-E-L-E-A-V-I-T-T on LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm really looking forward to connecting with folks. Amazing. Thanks so much, Zoe. And we'll definitely be following along. Thanks so much, Alana.